Um, yeah, I'm Karen Ishizuka, the chief curator here, and I am delighted to moderate this evening's um, program called Fueled by Fury uh, with the renowned ceramic artist Joan Takayama Ogawa and award-winning filmmaker uh, Renee Tajima Pena. And they're going to be having a conversation about using their anger at injustice to create a more powerful art that inspires social change. So the transformation of anger into social change. You know, I can't think of a more relevant aspiration, you know, at this moment. You know, I think Trump just announced his, his um, going into the, into the arena again. Um, you know, although it's not a surprise, I think that it does mean that for many of us that we are going to be dealing with, you know, a lot of frustration, um, irritation, exasperation, um, and to really try not to let it deplete us, you know, but instead fuel us. So that's why I'm so eager to hear from Joan and, and Renee tonight, because I think um, they have both, in their own respective fields, have been able to channel their anger into uh, a positive force uh, for social change. So I'm going to introduce each of them individually and have them share with you some of their work um, and the motivations behind them. And then we'll come together for a discussion uh, about the whole concept of turning negativity into a positive force. Um, I'm especially interested, and I mentioned that this, this in, in the green room, that they work in such different mediums. I think that it's really exciting to think about uh, the convergence of things that we don't usually think of going together. Um, you know, especially with Joan's work, because I don't, don't think you usually think of ceramics, um, and especially the very intricate and exquisitely beautiful things that she makes um, as being fueled by fury. Um, so, you know, as, as Joy mentioned, this is uh, in conjunction with her exhibition, Joy, Joan Takayama Ogawa Ceramic Beacon at the Craft in America Center. It is her first major survey and includes roughly 30 ceramic sculptures made over three decades. At the website, she states, it states that Takayama Ogawa makes objects that embody her worldview and life experience. She tackles the core issues that define our contemporary society, from the political to the historical, social, and environmental. She creates works that respond to the most pressing needs of the 21st century. Um, currently, Joan is a professor of ceramics and product design at um, Otis College of Art and Design. Um, but I have to note that in her former life, she was uh, an academic dean at uh, Crossroads a Private School in Santa Monica. Uh, she had just received her MA in education from Stanford uh, School of Education when she decided to take a ceramics class and became obsessed with the medium and created a new illustrious career as a ceramic artist who uses ancient Japanese ceramic forms in con creating contemporary pieces drawn from her American lifestyle. So, Joan, welcome to the stage. Hello. Thank you so much for coming today, and a lot of you had to travel pretty far to be here. Anywhere in Los Angeles is far to be here, so thank you very much. And. For those of you all online, good evening. So here we are. Here is Renee and, and myself over at the opening of the at Craft in America Center. Okay, let's go this way. All right. And I always want to start, well, cut off as many thanks, but that does say many thanks up there. And I'd like to thank everybody here at Janum as well as um, Craft in America and all the people that have 
put together my show. It is no easy task to do so. Um, a good curator friend said to me, the best artist is a dead artist. And so I tried to not interfere as much as possible. But I do want a, a big shout out to Carol Sauvignon of Craft in America and Freehand Gallery, and of course the PBS series that I hope you've all watched on online for many, many years. And for Emily Zayden for putting, for tolerating me and um, my lack of uh, attention to detail over height times, width times, depth or whatever it is I'm supposed to do in the year that I never write down and where the piece, I don't know where it went and all those details that I thought would make a survey easy because I already made the work but actually it was because my records were shoddy. Um, but here I am uh, at, in the opening pretty excited about everything but this was my for only dinnerware set that I have ever made. This is called Plate Tectonics Japanese American Dinnerware. Uh, made in 1992, and it's uh, six bento boxes and a sushi coral reef in the center, where I would uh, I would use that as a center. This is mounted on our former dining room table. While my husband went fishing one day, I knocked off the legs, called a friend, and mounted it. And my husband came home and didn't say a word. Uh, uh, I. <laughs> It was kind of a very good response, wasn't it? Uh, but here I, here I was doing a little bit of research on uh, America's concentration camps, of course, and it needs to be taught to every uh, generation. I did find a photograph of my mom at Poston on your left, and then my dad was uh, served in military intelligence. He was first, uh, uh, prior to World War II, uh, and actually prior to Pearl Harbor, he was uh, drafted into the American Army and placed in military intelligence, and he was studying for the invasion of Japan prior to Pearl War prior to World War II. He had trouble finding his father, who was arrested by the FBI, and he did find him finally at Gila River, and this is a uh, illegal photograph that my father took. Uh, before World War II, our family owned Meiji Laundry in Pasadena from 1908 to 1941. And of course, we lost the business uh, during relocation. And here, there are seven families that work together and over 200 employees with literally a cottage industry where the, uh, these Japanese American families wash the clothes, iron the clothes, and then the horse and buggy, and later on a, car, uh, a truck would come by and pick up the baskets and deliver it to uh, customers in Pasadena. Our family is from Tokonama, Japan, and we have been involved in ceramics since the 15th century. So to give you kind of a perspective, here is Tokonama here, and here is Nagoya. So we're just south of Nagoya. And 9-11 uh, really triggered, a, a, I don't know, a brain uh, freeze on my part because I heard President George W. Bush talk about uh, the possibility of relocating Muslim Americans. And that got me started to do this piece called Japanese American Cultural Baggage a couple years after uh, afterwards, and it was heading towards uh, the Renwick, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution, the Craft Gallery, but um, Vice President Quayle thought it was too anti-American. So, uh, and here I have the, the symbols, what I think are the symbols of, uh, of ja the Japanese American experience, the uh, Medal of Honor, and I also want to do a little shout out to Toyo Miyatake, who uh, brought in uh, lens, uh, photo lenses, uh, f camera lenses in his rice balls, allegedly. Um, and then, of course, I wanted to have the, bar the Japanese barracks. I have all of the birds peacefully swimming right now and not in a protest of freedom and flight. And, and the different industries prior to World War II, the fishing industry, the botanicals, the uh, the strawberries and the farmers and all that were involved in the floral industry and 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 the vegetable industry and many people had to start all over again. Here's a little close up, and this is also supposed to be a Japanese rock garden. I was trying to learn to screen print on clay, so I took um, photographs that were part of the public domain and collaged them and then printed them on clay tablets. This piece here, uh, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, 
This piece here is in the uh, Craft in America exhibition, and along the entire perimeter are 38, 37 last names of family, of families that were related to who are relocated. That means the last names, so it's the Takayamas, the Ogawas. So each name could represent four to five to 20 people, I mean, depending on the size of the family. But my family's small, so I called Renee's uh, cousin Elaine and said, could I use the Tajima names? And I was able to complete the project because it's, it's a very, very big family. But to me, and then also on the sides, I paint in gold. So wherever you see gold, I'm using solid gold. Uh, and it's a, it's a complicated technique, but not, not too terribly hard to do. But I wrote in gold pen, uh, President Force promise to Japanese Americans that relocation would not happen again. However, that's not a law, this is just a letter. Uh, Elaine Tajima, Renee's cousin, got me involved in doing something with Women Without Borders, and this is the first. Uh, this is a project too that we did together, and uh, and the barbed wire. Everybody's names are outside of the barbed wire to symbolize freedom at this point. But to me, every generation needs to know about relocation. Every generation doesn't know about relocation, and I did a webinar online called Not My America for Craft in America, and the number one comment I had were the virtual visitors who had never heard of relocation camps. So even though for this audience, I'm sure you've heard plenty, but I have to say that we must talk about this for every generation and not stop, and not stop. And I have a whole list of other uh, uh, issues that need to be brought up, uh, the, the Holocaust. Everyone must hear about the Holocaust. Everyone must hear about Native American genocide. Everyone must hear about the problems that we have uh, in America. Well, maybe we ought to sell, send busloads of banned books to Florida. Um, and <laughs> actually, Florida broke off in this piece. And, this <laughs> and I thought, boy, I'm just going to let them stay out there. <laughs> They're probably going to get flooded anyway with global <laughs> warming. But this was the uh, Hope for a Cure cupcakes, and I did a whole series of ceramic cupcakes during the pandemic, and I continue to make it because we all are wearing masks today, and we will continue uh, struggling with this pandemic. But here, this is America's first great reopening, which I think we took off the masks a little too soon. We uh, didn't open very comfortably. And uh, here, the American flag on top of the cupcake is upside down to warn about distress. Not my America. This is America's schoolhouse shooting gallery, just recently completed. Uh, Emily was Emily Zayden was over, and she said, "What are you doing with these uh, chocolate molds?" And I said, "Well, they're AR-15s." And I I pressed clay in them. And then she said, well, you have to finish this for the show. So for about a month, I was focused in on creating a, uh, an outline. Oops, sorry. There you are, Vicki. Um, an outline of the United States in black. And then I picked iconography that represented children and teachers. And then the chocolate AR-15s uh, molds were used to point all over into the shooting gallery. It's quite uh, striking that I would probably use the American flag here. It's, uh, and then over here is a, a pile of names of schools where the sh uh, eight or more people have died in a school shooting. And then there's this huge stack here of over 500 school shootings during the 21st century. Here you are, Vicki, um, because while Vicki came to the opening and she really struck me because she said as a teacher she didn't want to teach anymore because the threats in her school are just as harmful as, as a shooting for sure, but that, that threat. Uh, and, and children are scared to come to school at this point and, and their parents are scared for them to be at school. And I do think we were developing a national crisis and we have a teacher shortage. But people often ask about me. I'm an only child. There's mom, dad, and me. And my senior show uh, in 1989, there was mom, dad, and me. And I'm glad they were able to see at least this work. 
My dad was an architect, and here are some of his projects. Uh, you might recognize this fountain. It is uh, near the Superior Court building, and it is, I like to think of it as the cultural walkway of downtown LA. He worked on the entire project when he was with Adrian Wilson and Associates. He also worked on Arco Towers. But I think what was really interesting is that Mayor Yorty was the mayor, and we weren't big fans of Mayor Yorty. And uh, Mayor Yorty said that when the wind, this created a natural wind tunnel and the uh, fountain would spray his windows. So he wanted the fountain to, um, to be, you know, lowered it. So my dad uh, raised the water pressure and said, oops, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So maybe he was doing uh, something subvert, but uh, Mayor Yorty wasn't very nice to uh, people of color at that time. And so this was a, a quiet protest by blasting the windows of City Hall even more. My mom worked at the Huntington Hospital, so, it would be, uh, so of course I would do Hope for a Cure Cupcake dedicated to healthcare professionals. My family and the Osaki family in 1955 broke the a residential color line in Pasadena by entering the San Rafael district, the 91105 district, and it was uh, an upper income area, of, and Pasadena had never had people of color. Um, in 1961, the Saltman family broke the religious color line, so I had a friend. Um, and then Mr. William Carr was a real estate broker and developer, and he sold our houses to us in Pasadena. We were um, a social experiment, I think. Uh, and we were good social experiments, really. Uh, my father was a, a war veteran. Uh, my mother was a beauty queen. <laughs> my dad was educated as an architect. The Saltmans were professors at Caltech. And, uh, and then later on, Paul Saltman would go on and establish Ravel College over at UCSD as their first chancellor or vice chancellor. Um, but San Rafael Elementary School was, uh, was, uh, was hard in, at first. I think it was harder on my parents. On my first day of school, my pediatrician, Dr. Carl Erickson, came to school with me and carried me around and introduced me to the San Rafael families. He felt very strongly that there would be problems, and so he made sure, because he had nine pediatricians in a very robust practice, and he actually met with every family, welcoming them to school and carrying me, which made me feel like I was the center of the universe and I never really stopped thinking that. Uh, Dr. Joseph Messler was our primary physician for my parents, and he was the only uh, primary physician in, in Pasadena to treat Japanese Americans who were sick after they returned to Pasadena after relocation. And Dr. Messler's name is now on the trauma center at the Huntington Hospital, he and his wife Jane. Uh, his first wife was a gamble, and so my, we got to know the gambles because um, of, okay, it goes back to my grandfather who actually laid the rock walls with um, Native Americans of the gamble house, and then the gambles became their first laundry customer. And then, we, of course, we knew the, uh, Ms. Dr. Messler through his first wife, who was a gamble. Here's our home, and I'm not trying to show off this house. This is an itty bitty house, but when I was really very small, and I was this before pre, this is around preschool. These men with white coats came on and were wearing uh, hoods, and they were prancing around our front yard. And they burnt. This was ice plant here, and they burned a cross it, with salt in our front yard. And so my father created an escape plan so that if bad people came up this walkway, it was a circuitous way to find the front door, and you would go through and they could wander around, but they can't, you can't find the front door. As an architect, he created a situation, although he did not design this house, he created a situation where you couldn't find the front door easily, and then we could escape through the back door which was uh, French doors of my bedroom, and we could run here, and then there was a series of potted plants on wheels that looked like that was the end of the garden, but we would wheel out these potted plants, and we could escape, come up here, go through a very thick bamboo grove, go up to the, uh, to the row behind us, and we could hide in a neighbor's house behind us. So it was, not, it was very difficult to find that house because of the hilly uh, San Rafael Hills. 
So at UCLA, I like to tell people that I started my global warming worries uh, in 1973 when I first studied greenhouse emissions, studied plate tectonics. But it was here in Japan where I really had the, the, the water chef life-changing experience, and I'm so happy to see Grace and Fujia here because here we are, you guys, much younger. Um, but it was really a watershed, uh, life-changing experience cross-culturally, and I think all Americans should have the experience of being uh, foreign and trying to figure things out and how hard it is to come to the United States. Uh, once you have lived abroad, I think you're, you're changed forever. And hopefully, I, in my case, um, I never learned Japanese, but I certainly learned a lot about helping my own students who are uh, from abroad. At Stanford, I spent very little time at the campus. This is typical me, you know, here's this beautiful campus, and I'm here on the Bi Stanford Biological Reserve, which is an amazing location. Uh, it is a Native American site, but uh, it is, uh, you're only allowing six to eight people on, this, on the premises, and you, and you sign this contract that you only step on rocks and you never take anything home. But so I could see native trout and all kinds of cool things. I saw a lot of uh, interesting um, uh, remnants of, of Native American occupation, particularly grinding areas. And this was an opportunity that I had in Japan to work with uh, a J.E. Kidder in the archaeology department, but prior to that at UCLA, my first class, my first class, I signed up for dating techniques, and it wasn't the course I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Dendrochronology, obsidian hydration, carbon-14, and I couldn't do the math, so I... So there I was. My father was concerned that I was taking dating techniques, and then he was out of control with laughter because once again, what's next, girl? What's next? Um, but I went to Crossroads School. Uh, that wasn't supposed to happen either. Um, they didn't at Stanford. They didn't have anyone to interview for Crossroads School, and Paul Cummins was an alum. So I borrowed. Okay, how did this work? I borrowed the dean's secretary's daughter's clothes and I wore her, the secretary's shoes, and got the job. And, when, and they just really wanted me to interview in order to, uh, in order to keep the alums happy. You know, it's happy, it's important to keep the alums happy. But I, when I told the dean uh, that I was going down to Crosswoods, he said, well, that wasn't really your, the plan. And I said, no, it was, this is a great plan. And uh, it was a great six years. And here's my mentor, Arlene Weinstock, who came to the Craft in America show. And she really carried me through um, a great deal of the beginnings of teaching. And then finally at uh, Otis, uh, 30 years old, I decided to make mugs for the uh, Crossroads faculty. And I never returned. Here we are at, Cro at, at Otis. And uh, there's Ralph Becerra, our teacher, and here are my classmates. And oddly enough, everyone is still in clay, which is just shocking. And here, here are the ones in LA. We tried to get in the same order uh, at, the, at Craft in America. But a lot have gone on to have fabulous careers. These are learning to certain techniques uh, of china painting and underglazing. And uh, we had a demonstration on how to make brushes. And these are, uh, these are, this is my hair. Ralph Becerra used my hair for uh, brush making. This is my senior show work, but I went, also wanted to show how over time I've changed with a little more elegant uh, connections, but still using uh, techniques. Took me about 10 years to really nail these techniques. This is the future of Otis. These are my former students who helped install the Craft in America show. And uh, Sun is now teaching at Otis. And uh, Justin is, is installing and doing a lot of styling. And Javier is just starting to teach the elementary program at Otis and also with Craft in America. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased to know that uh, I can retire. A lot of people ask well, who influenced you, of course, Gustav Klimt. Of course, uh, uh, you know Fabergé eggs, but mostly interesting. I always like to think about the negative space between two points. This was my, I guess maybe it was a little bit of a protest. I was supposed to make a casserole dish. <laughs> Here's another casserole. 
another casserole. The sea urchin tea set is uh, an ode to our environmental, uh, environmental oceanography, but really, a lot of people ask, how do you make these little horned areas? And I just use um, ketchup bottles and squeeze out the slip. Back to plate tectonics. Then tea towers came as a result of having a tea party and afterwards cleaning up and thinking about my role in the kitchen. And I was stacking all of these uh, different vessels. So these are life-size teapots and cups. with And what really balanced everything out for me were these plates that would give me the balance. And I was running a long plumb line in my studio. But the idea is that the woman's role in the, ha in the home I carpooled for 16 years with an art historian, uh, Dr. Parmi Gentini, and so she, she was looking at these and said, well, you're making em uh, feminist commentary. And, uh, and I think she, and actually educated me a lot in those 16 years about uh, art history theory, and I was able to apply it a great deal. America's crude re uh, uh, re awakening is all about a sushi as the new fast food in America. And here are stacked cars and then the, the sushi, but the sushi, uh, we're, we're overfishing. We have, we're relying on, on uh, fossil fuels and airplanes. We're, we have, we're very slow to change. And here is the stock market commentary of the dot-com bust. And, and this piece up in the top is called Tulupomania. And here are the ticker symbols of obsolete companies that were destroyed. Here's Enron. Uh, that we're having, uh, and most of them don't exist. CMGI, Do, does anyone know who they are anymore? Uh, but it was a very hot. Uh, ticker symbol, and you know bears make money, and bulls make money, and pigs get slaughtered. The role of women continue, uh, especially with Sex in the City. I noticed that most of the characters are always eating, always buying shoes, always wearing purses. Um, I'm not sure how they did it, but I started my Sex in the City story. And, and so this is Samantha's bag. This is Rosemary's bag, and this is after actually the fashion designer at Otis Rosemary Brantley, and here's Japanese American tea bag. I thought that maybe Noah's wife made her contribution after the flood by carrying seeds to the to the uh, into the ark, and so this is Ark of Paradise, Noah's wife's tea bag. Tipping point. I was teaching in uh, liberal studies, and uh, my chair, Deborah Ballard, is here today, and I was teaching Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point. And so I thought, well, we're starting to tip the point with our over reliance on fossil fuels. And then later on, we hit a tipping point with miso deflated during the um, uh, the subprime lending disaster. We were on the pre precipice, really, of a financial global disaster. And so here is my house being in deflated mode, tipping over, but I, my face is in the middle of a million dollar bill. Here I have the miso shidu uh, bowl tipping out subprime lending houses. A real tragedy. This is California's role of, uh, and it, here is the Gold Coast of California and the various roles that we participated in with the American economy, really on the precipice of disaster. We continued fossil fuels, banks were sinking, houses were going under, people were losing their homes. Here is a Tamago Sushi, which I called the TARP program, with a fly on it. The flies keep appearing over and over again until I ran out of the plastic flies. The beautiful, beautiful Mira Nakashima table here from Craft in America. And I thought I was going to go into full cardiac arrest when Emily told me that these were going to be, my cakes were going to be on it. How, what, how dare I be on a Nakashima table? <laughs> this cake is life size, but it's Washington as usual with slimy snails and characters crawling around. Over here is the White House. And the snails say, let them eat Trump. <laughs> Over here is Trump 
pooping dollar bills for tr tr uh, Trump trash. <laughs> This one is Asian persuasion kitsch, which is, which is taking symbols of stereotypes about Asian Americans. This little caterpillar is actually the spout of a small teapot, and these reverse into cups. And this is uh, the Made in Pasadena series was the beginning of the cakes, and you know one fly ruins your meal, but three flies ruin your really ruin your ruin your meal. And there's something going on about overindulgence, too much sugar. Uh, and overdoing it. Hawaii's coral reef was under distress and a, it, it was starting to turn black due to a chemical in suntan lotion. And climate change. Climate change continues, so I made a LED driven uh, chandelier with, uh, suspended by aircraft cable. And during the pandemic, I was building, I was working about and thinking about the membranes and their contributions to American ceramics. The pandemic, hope for a cure cupcake with uh, pens that are syringes. This is the White House pandemic response team with a turtle and a snail. <laughs> It's very, we were a little slow, you know. And we had uncontrolled spread, too, of the virus. Um, here's the stimulus package with a few dollar bills inside. This is an, another healthcare professional dedication. So the Pasadena uh, Fire of, uh, of October 1993, it's called the Altadena Fire. It started out as the Pasadena Fire, but Pasadena didn't want to take responsibility for the fire, so I call it the Pasadena Fire because most of the houses were lost in Pasadena. And that's when I was reading John McPhee's um, material, uh, Los Angeles Against the Mountains, and how can we defy nature and expect to win? And so here I am working on a piece right now called California Wildfires, because they continue. But the fire went right past our house and nailed the, a small swim club, a neighborhood swim club that's below us. And then the wind changed, and the wind went right by, uh, the fire went by us again. So we, we were missed twice by the fire, and here are the heroes, the real American heroes that we have, our firefighters. In Craft in America during the shutdown, they kept me busy, uh, but we worked on uh, creating solar lights to power the, the lights inside these totems, and I call them the, the to they're figurative, kind of an accusation of the human endeavor and our contributions to climate change. And we were able to power these in the windows of Craft in America, even though we were shut down. My only piece ever displayed in <laughs> LAX was also during shutdown. <laughs> so here we are. But I do think yellow is a nice neutral, don't you? And this is uh, a last minute uh, fi finish too. I found this mirror during shutdown and decided that, oh, I'm gonna build an atoll, um, which is a body of water that is surrounded by coral, but to nowadays our coral reefs have been bleached. In, throughout the piece, there are little, st little figures and in white, these are the causes for climate change, such as our airplanes, our cities, cattle, um, the way we, conduct ourselves in our farming techniques. We're still slow to change, and the consequences are all in blue and white on this piece, talking about the flooding that we continue to have as a result of climate change. And lastly, I tried to make ad adaptations in 2006 and removed the front lawn and was fined $500 by the city of Pasadena for removing the front, the front lawn, which then I took, uh, allowed me to go down to the city of Pasadena and the mayor's office and start talking. Uh, and what, my, what we did was an organic garden. My husband is an organic, retired re organic produce broker, and he, he figured out that the average piece of organic produce was traveling 1,600 miles. So we decided to start growing it in the front yard and opening it up to anybody who came by. So the neighbors would take their children or senior citizens would come and pick vegetables for their lunches. And here we are with the same idea at Craft in America right now. We're growing food. We wanted to grow food in here, but it, 
trying to grow food in a south-facing window in September would have end up with fried food. Uh, so <laughs> uh, Justin Akioka, uh, one of my former students who now works a little bit with Craft America, he did some plant arranging. But what was interesting is I spent the summer working with sewer pipe clay. So this is sewer pipe clay, and if you think about sewers, and you think about sewer pipes, you cannot have the bacteria run into the body of the pot because you don't want it to leak. You don't want it to be contaminated in case it does leak. And so the sewer pipe clay holds water in, and the water doesn't evaporate through the sides of the pot. So I thought this would be a drought-tolerant uh, uh, solution keeping the openings fairly narrow to, to uh, decrease the amount of evaporation. And these are, you really can't tell that well, but these, this sewer pipe clay is fired at different temperatures to give different colors of the clay. And now, Lee is working with sewer pipe clay, and everybody at Otis is working with sewer pipe clay because we bought a 1,000 pounds of sewer pipe clay. And actually, now it's a commercially available because of my ex summer experimentation. So we're the first ones to play with it, and I'm very, very pleased with the results and the, what you're working on. So please come and visit us at Craft in America at uh, Ceramic Beacon. I have to tell you, I had to look up beacon because I didn't know what the word meant. Um, but I think it's to cast light on social, political, environmental issues and to hopefully gain some insights. And I really have to tell you that the person who has influenced my work more than anyone is Renee Tajima Pena. And I mean that because we've known each other forever. Our families have been friends for over 100 years, according to your Uncle Teddy. And while I was struggling to learn the techniques and the crafts of, of learning to keep clay from blowing up at 2,000 degrees, I, I held on to a lot of your messages. And I'm very pleased that I was able to, to uh, branch out and say a few things, even though my work is playful, even though it's often considered beautiful. When you get up close, I hope I hit you with a hammer of some sort. So I am so pleased to have Renee Tajima here, and, and I think Karen will, will introduce. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for all of you who are online as well. Thank you. Renee Tajima Pena is um a longtime friend and an icon of uh, Asian American media. Uh, she's an Oscar nominated filmmaker and a professor of Asian American studies at UCLA. And her films, um, Who Killed Vincent Chin, uh, My America, or Honk If You Love Buddha, have been exhibited internationally at festivals such as Cannes, uh, New York, and Sundance. Uh, most recently, she chronicled the Asian American experience as the showrunner and uh, series producer of the groundbreaking 2020 five-part uh, five PBS series, Asian Americans. And another project is she was co-founded, a co-founder with uh, Jeff Chang of the May 19th Project. Um, May 19th project was named after the joint birthdays of Malcolm X and uh, Yuri Kochiyama, and um, it was a social media, I'll have her speak about it, but just <clears throat> a social media campaign of 14 short videos uh, by 14 award-winning filmmakers. Um, that is a great example of being able to turn uh, anger, especially anger at anti-Asian hate into uh, highlighting solidarity, uh, standing and acting together um, as solutions for the way forward. So it's a great example for the discussion tonight. So Renee. Thanks so much, Karen, Janum. Joan, I had no idea. My god, she's so funny in the I learned so much about your family, and I thought our families knew each other forever. Um, but thank you for asking me to talk about my rage and anger, one of my favorite subjects. Uh, I, I'm going to start with, let's see, can I go to the, oh, OK. So um, Joan's family actually knows the Tajima side from Pasadena. This is my mother's side, the Ujie side. 
didn't live in Pasadena, they lived south of here, what is now known as Skid Row, what was then known as Skid Row as well. And um, so she ended up in Heart Mountain. And since you asked me to talk about rage, and this is where I kind of trace my rage and origins as a storyteller to is, um, and this is the story, I'm sorry if you've heard the story already, I talk about it all the time. But it goes back to when I was growing up in El Tadina, and uh, this was in like the late 60s. I was just 10 years old, and I was in Mrs. Count's class. I was looking for her picture. I couldn't find it, thank God. I probably ripped up the class picture, or maybe just ripped out her face from the class picture. But anyway, so she assigned us um, an oral history project. And we were supposed to interview somebody and then do a, you know, get up in class and give our report. So I decided, oh, I'm going to interview my mom and my grandma. My grandparents lived with us in El Tadina. And so I talked to them about their um, World War II experience here in Heart Mountain. There's my mom on the right, um, my grandpa, my uncles, and my grandmother is second from the left, I guess screen left. And um, so, just like I am tonight, I got up in class, I started to talk about their history of, you know, being evacuated from the homes, taken to Santa Anita Racetrack, and then Heart Mountain, et cetera, et cetera. And then I can hear from the back of the classroom, Mrs. Count, screaming, you're lying. And I said, no, my grandma and my mom told, told me this story. I had seen that picture, I, my mom actually, made us go to Heart Mountain in the 1960s on a family vacation. We were on our way to Yellowstone at that time. Well, I guess we lived in LA at that time. But, um, and we were, you know, as kids, like, oh my God, do we have to go? Because there was nothing there, it was desolate, which of course was the point. And so I knew that this was true. But Mrs. Count said, well, you know, they fabricated the whole thing because nothing like this can never happen in America. And I was so pissed off. I was the angry little Asian, you know, Leela Lee's cartoon character, angry little Asian girl, flipping the bird to the world. And um, I knew at that point, history is dangerous. History, and there's some reason why people want to erase that history, because I knew it to be true. This was my family's story, and I knew mom and grandma and everybody, my family and their friends, they always talked about the camps, and I knew they weren't lying, and I saw the evidence in the pictures and the little wooden birds that my grandfather would carve, and you know, his trunk, and every, I, I knew that it was true. And I had no idea that decades and decades, and you know, over 50 years later today, that kind of eraser was still going to happen, you know, the anti-critical race theory, anti-ethnic studies, kind of the banning of books. Okay, so this is uh, Julie Otsuka's book, Otsuka, Otsuka's book, When the Emperor Was Divine, um, which was based on her own family's um, concentration camp story, and it was recently banned by a Wisconsin school district. I mean, there's, books are being banned, you know, all over the United States. And so when I was coming of age, particularly in the 1970s, this was the real emergence of the Asian American movement and young Asian Americans who were demanding um, that we know our history, we tell our stories. In fact, when I was in high school, uh, the first time I ever saw an Asian American film was Karen's husband, Bob Nakamura, he was a young uh, UCLA student. He and Eddie Wong, another young UCLA student, came to the Pasadena Japanese Community Center, and I think Bob showed Manzanar, um, one of his first films, and Eddie showed a film about his father, and it just blew my mind. It's like, oh, you know, can we actually do this? Can we tell our own stories? Um, and that, so at the time, you know, my generation, we were hungry to understand our history. And I went to John Muir High in Pasadena, California, and a group of Asian American students used to get together and we would 
mimeograph back then, you know, you mimeograph stuff and it kind of smells bad and looks purple. And we would, I think we probably got the curriculum from the UCLA Asian American Studies or um, SF State, and we taught ourselves, which was amazing. I mean, we were sort of not very academic, but we would actually get together. Um, we had a, a teacher, Rod Ogawa, um, who was also from, probably knows uh, Joan's family, the, the, we all went to the same church. And um, he kind of helped us sponsor the group, but we would teach ourselves our history, these, uh, these mini, mini courses. And we fought for ethnic studies, and we marched um, for the hiring of students, of, of teachers of color in the district. I was really involved also. I used to take a bus into Little Tokyo and it was involved with LT Pro, the Little Tokyo People's Rights Organization. And, you know, I was filled with rage, but luckily for me, I was able to channel that rage, at least when I was a young person, a child and a teenager, I channeled it into activism. Um, then I went away to college. I went to Harvard. I was like the, I actually went to, um, uh, what's that school that in Mitaka, Joan? Uh, ICU, see I even forgot the school. I was there for three months, ICU. I was there trying to learn Japanese. I was famously the only person I think in the history of Japanese studies at Harvard who never learned Japanese. <laughs> but I had a great time in Japan that summer. Um, and so this is me with Fred Ho, who was a musician who was um, a year ahead of me. We were activists at, at Harvard. I was the chair, co-chair of the um, coalition um, for divestment. It was basically the student coalition against apartheid in South Africa. And very involved in, we were both very involved in the Asian American student movement at that time. Um, I wanted to be, actually when I went to college, I wanted to be a lawyer a civil rights lawyer, and that's how I thought I would channel all this rage into the law because, you know, the civil rights movement was such a inspiration to my generation. I unfortunately dated a couple of guys who were 1L at the Harvard Law School, and after that experience, I decided I didn't want to go near a lawyer. Um, <laughs> But, but the one thing, I remember a friend of mine um, who actually went to another law school, my friend Howard, who became you know, a really amazing constitutional lawyer and actually went to South Africa to help them um, write their constitution once you know, the apartheid regime was overturned. And I remember his, he told me, and this was like maybe after we graduated in the early 1980s, he said that, okay, we've, we fought to end these legal barriers to equality. I mean, we've been pretty successful at that, but they still hate us. They still hate us. And that, you know, means in the culture, the way people look at us as being, you know, the perpetual foreigner, as being, you know, demonized now as being the virus. Um, so that, that kind of representation you know, the story of who we are, the story of ourselves really mattered. So I, I ended up um, not becoming a lawyer, but I be, wanted to be a filmmaker. You know, part of it was having seen uh, Bob and Eddie's films and um, just kind of falling, when I was in college, falling in love with the medium. I, I didn't study film in college because I was rejected from the film program. I, they asked me for a portfolio. I had no idea what a portfolio was. So I was rejected and studied something. I wanted to, I thought, well, I'll study Asian American studies. Harvard still does not have Asian American studies. Maybe they'll have one class every once in a while. But I put together East Asian studies and sociology and kind of uh, figured it out. And I actually used to just come to the UCLA Asian American Studies Library every summer to do my research because it's the only resource I really had available to me. But again, our story matters and I decided to be, this was actually in college, um, this is what video cameras used to look like back then. They worked, 
they didn't look very good. But, um, but our story matters because that's a part of self-definition is a part of self-determination. Um, and also the story, I mean, this is a battle that's being fought today, the story of who we are as Americans. Because your, your story defines who belongs and who doesn't belong. And that's always been the case since we started to immigrate here to this country. Um, so that fight to define the national story, again, is so acute. And that's why you see, of course, um, books being banned, because that's a part of building that national story. So I became, I went to New York, became a filmmaker. Being an Asian American filmmaker is not only making films, it's also, particularly a documentary filmmaker, it's also building collective power and fighting to have the right to make films, to have access to the means of production. Because, you know, it's never been a given that we would have access, we would have that power, we would be able to tell our own stories. I mean, it's still a fight. There's been like a whole explosion of Asian Americans on screen just in the past five years, but you know, for many, many decades, um, it's been, you know, the been real lean years, I'll, I'll put it that way. So most of my films um, have been about the Asian American experience, but more broadly about the multiracial um, themes of social justice, uh, and not only Asian Americans. And I wanted to show you a clip and talk a bit about one film, which is also sort of a neighborhood film. Um, it's called No Mas Bebes, and it's a film about the 1970s, that era in the 1970s, and at LA County USC Medical Center, Mexican origin women were being sterilized without their consent. And this is the film I made with the historian Virginia Espino, who, um, and it's all based on her research. It was really her idea. Um, so I wanted to, oh, I forgot. So this is, I mean, you all know this general hospital. My, actually, my mother, my grandmother and I used to watch the soap opera together all the time during the 1970s, but I really didn't know about what happened at the hospital, even though it's so close. Um, and, you know, I was in little Tokyo like almost every weekend when I was a kid during that time. But um, it was another one of those stories that was really neglected and really erased for many decades. And just a handful of um, historians, scholars, and journalists, um, all women, uh, kept, like Virginia, kept that story alive and kept on researching the story. And so that's actually Virginia on screen right. And so the, I found out about the story through her where we both live in the same neighborhood, you know, just a few miles actually from the hospital. And we have kids the same age. And so when our kids were little, um, we would have play dates. This is actually my son's birthday party. There's my husband in the middle and flanked by, he's holding my kid in the sailor suit that's like he would do that because he didn't know any better. He put on the sail sailor suit. And those are um, Virginia's kids. And so we would have play dates and talk about our work. And Virginia told me about her research of these, you know, these, again, these women um, who at the hospital, they all went in for emergency um, labor because there was something wrong. So the, the um, pregnancy was in distress. And they would go to the hospital. And because of, you know, you can imagine, they were, you know, worried that their baby would survive. Um, they were often hemorrhaging. Um, they were medicated. And at that time, they were given a consent, quite often in English, a consent form um, for a tubal ligation which is, was essentially a permanent sterilization. I mean, you can, you know, technically you can reverse it, but it's very expensive, it's not easy to do, and it certainly would be, you know, um, out of the realm of possibility for most of these women. So it's, 
if you've ever given birth, I mean, just imagine and being given this um, consent form. Sometimes they weren't given a consent form, and sometimes their husbands were told, well, your wife will die unless you sign this consent. And so they would have, because it was an emergency, they would have a C-section, and then since they were on the table um, already, they would be sterilized right after giving birth. And in one case of one of the women, I think she was only 19, she's very young, um, it was her first child, and the child was born stillborn, and then she was sterilized, so she was never able to, to have a child. Um, so that really, when Virginia told me that story, I mean, here I, you know, had just had, I had this young child, and I thought that pregnancy and maybe not childbirth, but pregnancy and having a child was just so wonderful, so profound. It was like the, you know, the high point of my life and the idea that I could not, you know, I would be denied that ability to have a child because of somebody else's decision um, just filled me with rage. And I make films when something really pisses me off. Um, and to, you know, the story is really, again, the, the story matters. It's a story of the legacy of racism and this kind of imagery of Mexican women, and this goes back, you know, into history as being hyper-fertile. Um, there was this, uh, I found this Saturday Day evening post. It was like a big magazine back in the 1920s. This Pulitzer Prize winning author was writing about, I, I think they were uh, Mexican immigrant women in Los Angeles actually, and he just basically described them as, he literally compared them to rabbits, breeding like rabbits. Uh, when we were making the film, there was this, oh, I should have um, put the slide up, but we were, um, there was a shooter game called Border Patrol. And the shooter game, they, it was kind of a takeoff on, if you um, go down the five near the border, you'll see those traffic signs with like a fleeing family, women with kids. And so that was, um, you would see the woman with kids in the shooter game and the point would be to, you know, get the family. And then if you got a good shot, you know, the blood would splatter all over the screen. And, and so that kind of um, idea of the hyperfertility, um, this idea that, you know, Mexican immigrants would be uh, welfare dependent, um, uneducated, you know, overpopulate the planet, and um, that doctors knew better. The doctors knew better what was good for them. And, and it was so interesting that, you know, this idea that, oh, you know, somebody else would make the decision um, that you have too many children, you shouldn't have any more because of, you know, your immigrant status or whatever. And I thought of my grandparents, the ones that you saw in the picture in Heart Mountain. And so they were having children, raising their children during the Great Depression. They were poor during the Great Depression. They lived in Skid Row. My grandfather, oops, um, first came to uh, Hawaii to cut sugar cane when he came to the mainland here in, in Los Angeles. He was, you know, spent his life as a custodian and a so-called stock boy. Um, you know, menial jobs, my grandmother, um, used to clean Mrs. Sumi's, I guess it was a hotel, it was like a by the hour hotel, it was basically like a brothel. And that, um, that, that was their, so they were very poor, they didn't speak English. Um, because they were Asian immigrants, they were considered aliens ineligible for citizenship, so they could not be naturalized. They had no legal pathway to citizenship Yet they had five kids. They probably would have had more if they could have. They had five kids, you know. They had, within that kind of logic and reasoning of these, you know, immigrants, like, you know, they're going to be, like, dependent on the state and they don't speak English, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have legal status. I mean, that logic, if applied to my family, would have meant, you know, somebody could have sterilized my grandmother. 
Um, so it really hit me, and uh, Virginia and I decided, you know, we've got to make a film about this. Circumstances happened, and we couldn't make a f work on it for a number of years, but finally um, we, we battened down the hatches and raised the money and made the film No Mas Bebes. So I wanted to um, show you just a clip. They were extremely fearful being in that foreign situation and being told that you need an emergency cesarean section and you can feel blood pouring down your leg. And at that time, signing a consent for a tubal ligation. The doctor walked in and said, everything went fine. And I said, well, doctor, what am I going to use? Am I going to use birth control or are they going to put me the whatever I was using before? He goes, no, you don't need anything. We cut your tubes. And I said, why? He goes, well, you signed for it. I said, me? I go, I don't remember nothing. My youngest sister was born in L.A. County, USC Medical Center in 1968. And this could have happened to my mom. Um, you know, the, the idea that this poor immigrant woman with six kids, why in the heck does she want a seventh kid? There was shock last month over the revelation that the state of Virginia sterilized thousands of persons between 1922 and 72 in a program aimed at ridding the state of so-called misfits. Now it develops that similar programs were carried out in some 30 states. Documents collected from state records indicate the vast majority of the sterilizations took place in 12 states, with California accounting for nearly a third of the total. Después, cuando viene la pregunta, ahorita ¿Sí? nomás da tu nombre. Ah, yo soy Salvador Hurtado. Yo volteaba a ver al güerito y decía yo, pues está muy flaquito, muy delgadito. Y yo estaba rechoncha. Entonces decía yo, si lo abrazo fuerte lo voy a quebrar. Pero a las 2 de la mañana dije, ¿quién me falta por bailar? Y me faltó él. Y le dije, pues, vamos a bailar. ¿Qué quiero yo lo haré en la vida? Hace que me naceres por ti mi vida Todo lo que quiero yo lo haré en la vida Facete sincera, a mí me gustó mucho el chingueli mm -hmm. Es más puritano él que yo mm -hmm. La fe que me naceres por ti mi vida Todo lo 
en el quinto piso sale mi marido y entonces me dijeron vamos a hacer ahorita una cosa acuéstate aquí se fueron trajeron unos estudiantes ready decían el, ellos en inglés Mrs. Ready One of the senior residents showed us a But, um, so, you know, again, this was a, um, film that made with much rage and, but the, the one thing, well, the, the women eventually mounted a lawsuit. Um, they sued the doctors, the hospital, LA County, the state of California and the federal government. I mean, and the uh, wo woman in the blue you see is Antonia Hernandez, who um, was one of the, their lawyers just out of UCLA Law School. She and Charles Naparete and some other lawyers who are like all very young filed that federal lawsuit. In the meantime, Chicana feminists in the East Side were organizing around the um, anti-sterilization movement and building the feminist movement. And so that, and doing theater, guerrilla theater, and art projects, so art and filmmaking and social movements, activism has always, you know, been um, linked. And to me, systemic racism, and this is really a result of systemic racism, it's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem of practices, medical practices, laws, policies, stories, narratives, um, but resistance to systemic racism, racism is also an ecosystem. And so you saw that ecosystem at work in the 1970s with the resistance to these practices. And I see my work, and I, as Joan sees her work, clearly as a part of this ecosystem of questioning, disrupting, and shifting the story, shifting those narratives, but in conjunction with these larger social movements. So thank you very much. I think we're going to have a few minutes together, right? Thank you. That was amazing, Renee and Joan. It was um, truly, really inspirational. And I think that um, it shows, you know, no matter what our medium is, uh, whether we're artists or not, that we all can do something with that rage uh, to turn it around and to put, make it into a positive force. Um, we're running a little late. Um, we have about a little less than 15 minutes, um, but I wanted to actually um, preference if there's any questions that that we have in, in the audience. So I think I would rather, you know, have open it up at this point. Renee, I was just curious, what was the outcome of the lawsuit? The, hello? The outcome of the lawsuit was actually the state and the federal government had to reform their consent practices. So there was a victory to, you know, in the suit to the institutions in terms of reform, but the women never had personal justice. They were never compensated. Um, the county apologized to them a few years ago. Because of course, you know, the Board of Supervisors, everything is like a completely different. One of the um, leading activists during that time was Gloria Molina. And then she became, you know, the chair of the Board of Supervisors of LA County. So 
you know, she made it her business to really not only rebuild the hospital, but to really um, make sure the women had justice. She and Hilda Solis and other um, people in the in the board of soups. Hi, Vicki here. Um, I have a question to both of you. Being female and being Japanese American, presumably about Sansei, what was your family's reaction to your rage and your anger? And, you know, because culturally, we know that it's not kind of exactly the um, touted to be loud and angry. My mom was often looking like she was going into full cardiac arrest. <laughs> Uh, and she was she was very proper and uh, always worried about my behavior, um, but my father was uh, was pretty much a, a rabble rouser to a certain degree and uh, uh, was the exact opposite actually. So I don't think there was any pressure for me to to not speak out, but I do speak out in a different way and uh, and I think I use humor as grim humor. Dark, it gets kind of dark sometimes. I, I mean, my parents, I, I was the fourth, you know, the youngest, so I think they were just like really tired by the time I came along and I did, did what I want. But I remember like my grandparents, the Grandpa Ujie, who you saw, they lived with us and he, they treated me like a, a son or a grandson. So he used to do my chores. He said, no, you should just have fun and study. And he thought, um, I should be like Patsy Mink. I should run for Congress or president or something. And my father also thought I should like consider being on the Supreme Court or getting a joint MBA law degree. And it's, you know, they, that's, I was just treated like that. I remember when I gradu graduated from Harvard and went to New York's Chinatown, got a job for 250 an hour in, at a media art center there. Um, and then I eventually edited a um, Asian American magazine called Bridge. And my dad used to get stacks of Bridge and come to Little Tokyo and have a little stool and sit on the street and sell the magazines. <laughs> so they were always really, really supportive. And you know, if I like screamed or whatever. I, but you know, back then, I mean, I never saw my parents like when I was growing up. I was just out, you know protesting or playing or partying or whatever. They didn't know what I was doing. That's true. I don't think we had helicopter parents. No. <laughs> Not like me. And I don't think they wanted to know either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we actually do have one question from online, too, that I can share. Um, from Vicky um, on Zoom asks, are we stuck in a perpetual loop or do you think we will break the cycle slash break through this time? And how can we make that happen? So I think a big question, but that's from Vicky. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> History does have, you know, that old saying has a way of repeating itself. And I think that um, this systemic racism that we have seen that uh, President Trump has revealed I have to remember that almost 78 million people voted for him, and so therefore there is this underlying um, attitude of racism and systemic racism that we shouldn't deny and uh, put our heads in the ground. You know, I think we really do have to uh, think about the planet, and we have to think about a lot of things that for our own survival, but we also have to remember who we are and I was just reminded by uh, Dr. Sammy Flores the other day when I, uh, when I was sitting around in the faculty office and he said, you know, I'm from, the, I'm from Puerto Rico and our, my family were slaves, but when I study American slavery, it was much, much worse. And I think that that is the much, much worse that is uh, living among us and, uh, and here. And we have to remember that it's there. <laughs> I think the most optimistic way I can look at it is right now we're experiencing a backlash. Yeah. But that's not an offensive. It's a backlash. I think an offensive would mean we're in worse shape. 
So I think this backlash was really expected. But you know, you can't stop history. His, history is moving in a certain direction, and I think that uh, the people who are banning books and banning our history and you know erasing us is um, they you know they want to stop history and revert, but that's not going to happen. One of my cer uh, former ceramic students, uh, who is Ukrainian, said the other day to me, um, "America has a way of rebalancing itself," and uh, and so you know I was very I was thinking, well, do what is going to happen in this election on Tuesday? And he said, "America has a way of rebalancing itself," and yet here he is, not, uh, d completely disconnected from his family in Ukraine. He doesn't know where they are. Um, they cannot make a cell phone call because the phone call will be traced and uh, their family would be bombed or, um, you know, uh, killed. And so he really doesn't know this, the status of his family. And, uh, and then I had the great uh, Aaron Tool in class the other day, a, 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 a veteran who said the best memorial is peace. And I think that that's what I want to think about right now is the best thing about war is peace. And uh, I think we have to be very, very careful and remember about all the suffering in this world and all the people who are suffering. And, and then as climate change continues, it will be our poorest people who will, be, who will die and who in millions could potentially die. So I think these are grim times. Um, and yet we still, as Americans, we do rebalance. And I think we do have a responsibility uh, to assist, but also to put our technology and our innovation and our creativity to creating uh, uh, innovations to balance the global destruction that we are seeing almost every day. Uh, and we see it with our fires, our floods, our, uh, our food insecurity, and uh, I look forward to the next, uh, this generation coming up who are taking true responsibility. Some of the greatest things in my life are the students and their eagerness to take on these huge, huge tasks. And that's why I always say every generation must hear about the inequities, about the injustices, about the, the lack of freedom and yet they still have to work hard to survive and economically survive but also to make a difference, and we all need to work together to save the planet. Yeah, and speaking, uh, Joan's talking about her student, and uh, one of the questions, and it's not a question, but Michael shared in the chat. As a student of Joan's from Crosswords High School, oh, I cannot yes. emphasize enough how important her teachings around social justice have been to me throughout my life. I am so amazed by her work in ceramics and its relevance and beauty. Is that Michael Lewis? Michael. Michael. It say My goodness, I think I taught him. 40, yes. 40, call, call, he, he's, he's, on, he's on Zoom, so oh. he, he's listening to you. Wow, because uh, uh, I think Lewis. I taught them farewell to Manzanar 40 years ago. Yeah. 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 And yeah. we brought uh, Jean and uh, Jim Houston uh, to school. And everyone received a bento box. Uh, for the first time, had Japanese food, and the students ate the rice and threw out the sashimi. So, <laughs> <laughs> and we had the East West players come too. So it was a real, and we celebrated it on February nineteenth. So it was a very That's important a, day. Yeah, uh, day of remembrance is yes. the, what the day uh, the EO nine zero six six. And signed. I have to really thank Paul Cummins because Crosswoods was a small school, and I called him up at home and said, "I have a big idea." And then uh, uh, he said, "Well, we're going to support this by calling NBC, CBS, and ABC." <laughs> so it was televised that this little small uh, school, school in Santa Monica, in Santa yeah. Monica had these authors and they had this uh, Japanese experience. And for the first time, many of them ate Japanese food. Yeah. And I do think that food crosses some of the natural boundaries. Yeah. And yeah. I, think that, that yeah. I think that's very important. Yeah, and I think we can't underestimate uh, a high school teacher. You know, I think that oh. it really starts, it has to start there in elementary school. 
um, you know, that horrific story that you told about your teacher. You know, I've heard that from so many people, you know, either that you're lying or, oh, no, that's not right. I mean, it's just brushing off as an adult to a child. You know, so it, it does have to start early, I think, mm -hmm. and this ability, I think, to to recognize uh, your own feelings and rage and be able to turn it around. I think that's that's why I think this discussion is so important tonight is I think a lot of people just feel despair. And you get stuck in that. So, you know, when you talk about the self-healing and self-love, part of it is being able to do something about it, not just for yourself, but, you know, for the, for the better good. Many people tell me that I, I'm lucky that I get to be able to fuel my rage through clay and through an art form. You can pound it. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that, uh, actually, I think the young man who was on Zoom there, I think I taught him eighth grade. And I would really like to reach out to the middle school st uh, yeah. teachers to um, step up and r uh, really teach kids around seventh and eighth grade because they're just taking off and reading independently. And I think that's so important to uh, adopt books for them to read that really penetrate their hearts. And uh, that's what made Jean Wakatsky's Houston story so relevant to the eighth graders because yeah. she was that, about that age. Yeah. yeah. So for those of you wondering, um, Joy has worked out um, this wonderful way that people on Zoom can actually call in. And uh, if we had you know, even a larger group here and sometimes when we were able to pass the mic, uh, that you with uh, smartphones could actually just type in your question and it comes to to me or, or to mm. so you know it's a it's a it's part of this technology that has so, mm. so much technology is sometimes just pizzazz but you know there's actually things that work sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay we are at uh, sort of an end but I do want to uh, preference people here in the audience if you'd like to you know say something yeah oh there you go yeah I had a question for both of you um, but you both have channeled rage into such incredible work across two different mediums but I was wondering well as someone who's experienced this personally <laughs> have you ever had trouble um, channeling rage and found rage to be kind of blinding or distracting because I feel like when I channel rage in my work it's kind of like playing with fire and sometimes the fire will spill out of the kiln or blow up the pots or you know <laughs> burn the film so yeah well as a podcaster i think renee if you could uh, uh answer uh lee's question because uh, lee actually i think is here because of me but i think he wanted to meet you <laughs> um, no you know i think because i've always my work has always been creating films, but you know, being a media activist at the same time. So the activism really channels my rage as well. So I have a double kind of, and then I have a glass of wine with dinner and everything, <laughs> something stronger when I was younger. But um, so I, I, it, it's funny. My husband, who's Mexican American and grew up as a like migrant farm worker, like completely different experience. But he was a uh, boycotter in uh, Ed Couch Elsa, Texas. If you remember the Chicano school blowouts here in Roosevelt and Garfield, all over the Southwest. And so they were um, one of the, I, I, actually they were all expelled. He was the youngest boycotter. And it was the first big case of MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And we often talk about, even though we had such different experiences, we both had grew up with this rage, of course, during that time about racism. And but we had politics, we had activism. So it just completely had this kind of calming effect because you just you can channel everything into that rage. So, um, so, yeah, no, it's, I don't know. 
I found it pretty hard uh, at first when I was studying Japanese American history at UCLA because I had to be an East Asian studies major because we didn't have an Asian studies major. And I would, re I would sit in URL at UCLA and I would just read pages and pages of just injustice and it was a very hard way for me to live. It, 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 it was torturous actually. And I would take, I would go away from that and go into uh, education at Stanford knowing that I was actually admitted to that school so that I could write a chat, one paragraph in a state adopted book that was being edited on relocation. So it, it, the, the professor wanted me to write that portion. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was kind of interesting because I think I was a third or fourth Asian American in school. And I think part of my uh, s struggle has always been a token, you know, the first here and the first there. And I'm sure you had the, those firsts. And yet um, it's, not always comes, it's not always comfortable to be the first. Um, it's not always the one to, uh, to break those kind of boundaries. Uh, on the other hand, uh, somebody has to do it. Right, and I'd rather be a token than nothing out than nothing, you know. And that's, I think, part of the 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 reason I stay in the classroom is that this is my forty fifth year in the classroom, wow. and I think that just being there in the classroom uh, matters to the students at wherever I am. <laughs> yeah, forty five years. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> You must have started when you were 10. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's not true at all. <laughs> but it, it has been a wonderful ride. It has been wonderful. Well, we're all better off for it. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and Renee, too, has been in the classroom for a long time now uh, at UCLA. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, it's wonderful actually to be in person and all of you online. I think that's one of the things that we've learned from this uh, pandemic is that we can reach out and, and be part of each other's lives uh, regardless. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I get one you. more round of applause for Karen as well? Thank you so much for moderating. And Joan and Renee, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I also just want to remind you to make sure you go and visit um, the Craft in America Center and Joan's incredible exhibition, um, Ceramic Beacon. So please, please go visit that. And thank you again to the whole team at Craft in America. Um, we're just really excited to do this partnership and be able to have this discussion here tonight. So with that, thank you so much for being here. Um, please stay safe and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.